Today I talk with e-commerce conversion manager Dave Powell from TomTom and we're going to learn how they were able to quickly switch gears when the pandemic hit and a lot of people all over the world suddenly stopped driving. My name is Gil Janssen and welcome to Zero Cafe, the award-winning podcast where I show you the behind the scenes of optimization teams and talk with their specialists about data and human-driven optimization. My goal with the Zero Cafe podcast is to spread a mindset of experimentation and validation and improve quality standards in digital marketing. You can be an enormous help reaching this goal by sharing this episode or any other episode with your colleague. And if you're not subscribed yet, make sure you are by checking this in your podcast app. It really means a lot, so thank you for doing that. In case you missed the previous episode, last week I spoke with Ricardo Tahar, in which he taught us about the main pitfalls agencies encounter when working on zero projects and how to prevent them. You can listen to the episode on the Zero Cafe website or in the podcast app you're listening with right now. This episode of Zero Cafe is again made possible by our partners, SiteSpec, Content Square, Online Influence Institute, Online Dialogue, and Convert.com. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 41. Yeah, Dave, welcome to the show. And of course, we'd love to start with getting to know you a bit more. So let's get started with how you got involved with Zero. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, if we rewind the clock back many years, and I mean way back to when WAP was a thing, building WAP sites on mobile, which, yeah. WAP we're talking about. Yes, indeed. Um, I studied at Bradford University, and uh, it was very new for the time. It was a BSc in Internet Product Design. Uh, What that meant was, uh, yeah, we focused on electronic imaging and media communication, which was a very broad umbrella for study. But it taught me how to how to code, how to use Photoshop, generally how to produce content, how to communicate an idea digitally, um, and that set the foundation for for really focusing in the end year on internet product design. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I left there and I began just doing front end jobs, really, um, coding websites way back when IE was still a problem. Um, and from <laughs> there, yeah, I just mainly did front end jobs, and then I eventually came to the Netherlands and uh, it got a job at booking.com. That's kind of how it all began, which was maybe even 15 years ago now. So it yeah. was right back in the beginning. I think it had just changed into bookings. So yeah, this is well before, well before they got bought out by Priceline. So that's where it all kind of really started. Yeah, working on the affiliate white label program there. And uh, yeah, we were styling the content to to look like uh, yeah the affiliates websites. Booking is often mentioned as one of the big examples of uh, how to do uh, zero or optimization or experimentation. How did you experience that uh, 15 years ago? What was it like? It was a massive turning point for me because be- coming from mo- of, a, of a design background and also having this um, purity for aesthetics, you know, like, things need to look great. That wasn't always the case in terms of CRO and. It was where form meets function. But then if it's really selling very, very well, does it need to look pretty? And it, it, it addressed some fundamental issues for me um, coming from the design background, which sort of threw away some of the, the, the rule books. And I was well, this actually works. The customers yeah. are buying it. It converts. It, it, it makes sales. So what, what, better, what better way to move forward? in a career than actually using science-based design decisions, which uh, for me, yeah, it really, it's, it really sparked my interest. And now you work for, for TomTom. Uh, can you tell us a bit how the, how the team, uh, what the team looks like and, and what you're working on? Yeah, I'm in the e-com team. Um, we're mainly just looking after TomTom.com. Um, we have yeah, websites all over the, all over the planet. Uh, different countries and uh, yeah we basically take care of sales through the website but um, our particular focus is on replacement sales from the email database so we have a big team there's about 10 of us but we're in a smaller team there's three of us that are based um, um, are concentrating mainly on reselling so uh, getting all the customers that have a device or had a device to get a new one. That's what our focus is, just the three of us. We've got a front-end developer. We've got me, which is one of those T-shaped people. And uh, we've got another T-shaped person next to me, Ariel. Um, she's also you know, very good with uh, with analytics. 
So, okay. Yeah. I can imagine that uh, when the, when the pandemic hit, that uh, people drove around a lot less. It did it have a big impact on you guys, or it had a massive impact? I mean, we we also have the traffic index. I mean, TomTom's all about maps and traffic data, and uh, I was actually looking at the TomTom traffic data. That's not part of my my role, but it's just interesting to see the level of um, traffic drops so significantly the minute lockdowns began to be imposed. So I was comparing uh, Amsterdam and London. They'd obviously not, you know, even reached the lockdown yet. It was, it was yeah. insane to see how how the, the graphs just really tanked. Uh, yeah, phenomenal, really. But um, on the flip side of that, when uh, the lockdowns have eased up, uh, people are more are going to choose a car more. So we've seen a huge increase in people using cars because they don't want to use the trains and these kind of things. So... It's had a downside, but it's also had an, an upside once people are, you know, free to roam, so to say, for a while. <laughs> yeah. And uh, how, how has it impacted your work? Did, could you just continue on what you were doing before, or did it have a mass- massive impact also on what you were actually doing? Well, at that point, obviously, everyone was very shell shocked. We didn't really know what to do. A B testing didn't seem feasible. People were not on the website. I mean, people yeah. were not buying things. So. Yeah, we really had to take a, a good look at what we were doing at those times. And we thought it would be perfect opportunity to pick up the things that you can't necessarily measure, that you can't necessarily say, well, this is worth that. So in that time, we shifted to a different different platform. We, we were working loosely with React, but we uh, created all these new templates for a sales page. Um, and in that creation, I switched to using uh, Figma. Because the developer, he said, "Oh, we should try using this. It's going to uh, decrease the times that we've, you know, that we've got from design to into actual code for it being live." So we managed to shave off and optimize that process that we were having. That's what we were looking. We we're looking internally to see how we could optimize our own workflow um, and get things built faster. Um, so yeah, I taught myself Figma uh, with the prototyping. Got really into that massively obsessed even um wonderful tool uh, so we built that um i also got stuck into content square because uh, i didn't never, never really had enough time to really dive deep into it and understand it on a fundamental level so mm-hmm. i spent a lot of time looking in content square and then i'd worked out these these uh yeah these flaws that were that, that were happening that we seen in the in the replays and then using figma to sort of solve some of those problems and then, yeah, it was producing quite a nice little flow between us with this, you know, with the insights. And then, yeah, we were obviously filling the backlog. But yeah, during those times, it 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 really helped us to sort of do the things that we wouldn't necessarily have had time to do. So it was a good thing, I think. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, you made good use of the time. Right? You usually have a backlog of things that you think of uh, okay if i have time sometime in the future <laughs> i can do those things those basic things to fix workflows to optimize my own stuff that you never get around to uh you started picking up those things right yeah absolutely even one of the jobs that i that i picked up and it, I, we didn't have one repository of all the images um from past from our past devices we didn't have it they were all sort of scattered about everywhere and they weren't PNG. So I took two days and I stripped them all, all PNGs, all looking nice, all in a Figma file. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Got, got things organized. We really did. Exactly. That's, that's something you normally wouldn't wouldn't do or normally wouldn't prioritize uh, if you have other things to do. Absolutely not. Yeah. So uh, you, you talk about Figma. I see it come uh, come up a lot uh, lately. Can you tell a bit about the tool? What does it do? How, peop- how people in Ciro uh, can use it? Well, um, it's like Sketch, but it's also like um, Excel, the online version. You can actually work on a design collaboratively. It's not saved on your hard drive somewhere. So I can work on the same file as a developer. I can work on the same file as the copywriter. It's the same file, so you can see them live making the changes there, which has never been seen before. It's never been done. So, uh, yeah, the point of collaboration, is, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. And the yeah. plugins that are being built for it, it's anything that you can think of. It's it's just, it's it's developing so fast. And it's also, it's free. So, I mean, if you're a small team, two or three of you, it's it's ideal. You don't pay for software. I mean, everyone likes that, not paying for something. 
for over 10 years now online dialogue advises about evidence-based conversion optimization with a focus on data and psychology. We see that analyzing data and recognizing customer behavior results in a better online dialogue with your clients and a higher ROI. The team of strategists, analysts, psychologists and UX specialists gathers valuable insights in the online behavior of your visitors and together with you they optimize the different elements of your CRO program through redesign, expert reviews, A-B tests and behavioral analysis. For more information about their services, go to onlinedialogue.com. So it's basically a SaaS version of, of Sketch? Yeah. So. Do you use it to uh, actually create designs or is it more like prototyping or? I would say we, uh, I use it for everything now. So even if we've got a, an email campaign uh, and the landing page, I'll I'll try to create the whole flow so that what we're looking at, how does it feel? How how How's it experienced by a customer? Because then you can really, you know, with a f- fine tooth comb, go through the copy. Then you can say, hey, copywriter, do you think this flow's... And you're all looking at the same thing, the same experience from email to landing page, because uh, our email department's slightly separate from from who builds the landing page, so that there can be uh, yeah some things that don't quite match. But in this instance, then everyone can collaborate around the same file and make sure it's got continuity for a customer. It's a freemium model, right? So you start out free, and they do have paid options, yeah, which start at twelve dollar per editor per month, I see, depending on the package, but. Um, yeah, it's easy to get started uh, at least. So it's, it's, a, it's a great way for, for a CRO to basically communicate with the designer and developer on what needs to be changed. Absolutely. And I mean, even in that, you can uh, create duplicates of things and say, well, this is version A and this is version B. This is what we want to test out. Yeah. So, you, I mean, even once you've, you know, you've built your design, you can see how it actually feels, how it reacts. So... Yeah, and even in then you can plug it into to Maze. I don't know if you've heard of Maze. It's that's also a, a UX kind of analytics tool. You can set um, yeah goals for a for a customer to do. So uh, you see this website, you're interested in buying something. Um, please find out if it comes with a magnetic mount. So that's the goal. You can see uh, the customer's gone, uh, and it records all the clicks, so that you can even get. UX analytics and Maze is also free. Uh, UX <laughs> analytics, also a freemium model. Yeah, yeah, it is. So yeah, UX analytics just uh, at very very low cost. Let's say, and you can get yeah. you know insights and validation before you've even really coded anything, which I think that's kind of key these days. I hadn't heard of uh, Maze before, so I'll definitely check that out. I'll, I'll uh, add the link uh, for everyone uh, in the in the show notes. So. Um, Basically, you work on retention at uh, at TomTom. So, what would you say? What are the most? What are the main drivers for people? Well, a to to want a replacement in the first place, and then b uh, what triggers them to actually um, uh, buy the upgrade from you guys? Well, uh, the the business business model in the past, we the older devices you used to have to pay for map updates. That was mm-hmm. that was a big re- revenue driver for us. Um, but of recent years, we've started to uh, sell the devices with with maps installed on them already, and then the, then the updates just come periodically. Um, that was something that we actually surveyed customers um, way back when we first started all the optimization. What was the reason for you purchasing uh, this device? So it's all the decisions that we've made and all the messages that we are sending out is based on customer feedback iteratively so what we think that we're saying on the website about these devices and what how we were selling it wasn't necessarily the reason that customers were buying it so yeah. we did lots of surveys and we keep doing surveys and we keep like the top five reasons the wow factors of why people actually do purchase something so in effect customers tell us why they purchase it and we highlight that message in different ways and communicate it to other customers which haven't gone through the whole process and oh oh is that really is that really like that? I didn't know they've read the small print or whatever and we've just elevated that message 
and then rolled it out and seen sales yeah. increase, increase, increase. What, what are a couple of those reasons? Do you do you know them? Uh... Yeah, the fact that they don't need to pay for the maps anymore because, yeah, that was a big thing. And then the maps were yeah. outdated. And uh, obviously, it's not a good experience having, having a device that's, you know, the maps are not up to date. Yeah. And also, a lot of customers really enjoy uh, the updates over Wi-Fi. Now, the, there's no need to plug it into a, a computer anymore because that was yeah. quite a lengthy process for those times. Bigger screens is also a, 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 a key driving factor. It's because it, the more you can see, it's a brighter screen. It's just at a glance you can really see the road ahead and the changing situation. So yeah, from a from a safety angle, you know, I I use one. So yeah, I I, yeah. I really enjoy driving with it. Yeah, and I can imagine that also the the whole customer expectations changed a lot in in the years that uh, TomTom devices are around. Now people are also used to using their mobile way more using uh, Maps apps on their mobile. And that might be the, the thing they compare it to. Um, uh, while as before, they might, uh, when TomTom Tom started, they compared it to just a book <laughs> in their car. Yeah. Uh, so that's a whole different thing, right? Yeah, that's very nice. That. I think we're going to talk about our comparison tables a bit later on, but um, <laughs> I really, that's, that's, a, that's a nice one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's true. I mean, the technology has moved along um, very much so. And we, you know, we accept that people do use mobiles um, for, for the navigation purposes. Um, but, for, but for me, I mean, talking from a, from a personal standpoint, I like a tool to be for that in particular. For me, my phone is my phone. I don't, I don't want it there. A TomTom is designed for navigation. And I find some of the other apps, they're, they're not as good in my view. Um, because TomTom's been doing this for the longest amount of time. They've got a, a lot of data on it. I mean, they're still around for a reason because I think they're very good at mapping data. Um, yeah. But it is interesting to see the the big shift to mobile, and I think it is much a, a younger audience that are, are definitely sticking to this. And, yeah, to be fair, it's it's not a market that's going to last forever. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. But on that, you've also got a lot of people that have got inbuilt navigation in the cars and that's invariably highly out of date and really not particularly good i'm going to give you an interesting example i hired a car when i was in in spain and that had an an inbuilt navigation thing and i just couldn't use it it was it was impossible so you know if you can take your portable device with you pop that on the windscreen you're in a foreign country you know your device works you got that you know that you can relax and know how you're going to navigate in a different country so it's still got its uses where, you know, necessarily inbuilt stuff doesn't work. It's, I think you get used to it, what you what you like. And that's the interesting part, right? So you can use that uh, feedback from customers, not only to improve uh, basically your website, how you sell stuff or, or, or the retention part, but also feed that back to the company saying, hey, uh, we, we get all this feedback and it's not necessarily the, the website that's, that's limiting people from buying, but it's actually the way our business model works or how the product currently works, that's hindering people from actually buying this. Like I said, uh, with people don't wanting to uh, download uh, a map update, they just want this to automatically happen. So let's feed that back into product and let hopefully they can fix it. Absolutely. I can't say any more on that topic, um, <laughs> but absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. That's fine. Um, that's, 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 I think, great to hear. And I think that uh, a lot of uh, the mature zero teams um, are, are dealing with this more and more. That's um, um, usually with zero, uh, the usual, usual starting point is, is the website uh, because uh, that's where, where you at least own. Uh, it's an own channel and you have a lot of data there. That's, that's a point where you have a lot of data. Uh, so it's, relatively easy to start zero there, but often uh, you, you very quickly will see that the, the website might not be the bottleneck. I need to uh, look for other uh, other places in the in the funnel, which might be the product itself. So what would you think is an, is an insight that you might have that you don't think others have in or outside zero? Um, my, my main thing of the, of the past couple of years has definitely been, like I said, I was going to mention it, comparison tables. Yeah. I feel like such a geek saying it. And because I get, I get excited about it now because um, who, <laughs> who would get excited about a comparison table? What's wrong with me? You do, Dave. But I do. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've done 
so much testing now on comparison tables that I find them absolutely fascinating. And so do customers. Because we've looked at EEG data, you know, they, they put the, yep. the, the helmet thing on and then we watch their uh, levels of joy and frustration. Um, and these things really help customers to understand the difference between things. And there's so many different ways that you can actually lay out the information to make it uh, clearer, less clear, and answer answer questions that people have about, is it features, is it benefits? Um, yeah, and you can see the levels of, of joy that it helps them to understand something that's fundamentally quite complicated. And a number of things that um, that they can compare at the same time. I believe there's only seven things that we can store in our brains at any one time. So that's why I like a comparison table because it maxes it out to the things that you can store in your brain to make a decision on purchase. Um, so yeah, on that, we've done so much A-B testing, heat maps, looking inside people's brains, user testing. For me, yeah, if you're in a in a position to to use a comparison in any way you can, you should. It's uh, it's a, it's a very cool tool. We've even used um, personalization, so we've taken their old device and pitched it against the new generation ones. So at a quick glance, they can see, oh, that's what's different. So it's... We've really elevated that. As I said before, you know, we went through, uh, you don't have to pay for maps anymore. So we elevate that. We put that in the yeah. thing. Oh, I do. I don't. I do. I don't. That's in. That's not. And uh, yeah, fine. comparison table geek, whatever <laughs> you want to call it. But yeah, that's my uh, that's my, my, inside, my inside tip. If you can yeah. use comparisons and you can use personalized comparisons, then that's even an extra an extra level. Fightspec offers a worldwide unique A-B testing, personalization and product recommendation solution. Sidespec works service side without any tags or scripts, which guarantees an optimal performance. The Sidespec solution eliminates delays and the chance of any flickering effects. And this approach also ensures that the current and future browser security rules like ITP and ETP don't make an impact on your A-B testing and personalizations. For more info, visit sidespec.com. Yeah, because at TomTom, Tom, people, uh, when using the device, you have to have a TomTom Tom account, right? So uh, I can imagine that uh, more and more people on the website also log in. Uh, so then if they do, then you know which device they have. Absolutely. So you can use that for for personalization. Yeah, completely. Yeah, and then we sort of follow them around with it. <laughs> yeah, that's how personalization works. It's uh, yeah. Yeah, we can we can point out the things that they're missing out on with the new devices compared to their old devices. I mean, in some exactly. situations, the devices are so old we we don't support them anymore. The maps mm-hmm. don't fit on them. It's it's not a good experience. It's not a good driving experience any longer. And it is time to update and get a new one. You just mentioned uh, uh, heat maps, EEG. W- what kind of uh, research methods do you guys usually use for for your research? Um, I would say it's kind of a bit ad hoc, to be honest. It's not, not some sort of great roadmap plan that we have. Um, it's just sell as much as you can. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it starts with like a gut feeling. And uh, yeah, if we're watching people use use the website with session recordings, you can sort of, you know, you can follow the mouse and they're actually sort of reading things and you think, well, does it make sense that it's this way around? Should it be this way around? Okay, let's run a test. Let's just flip the content and see how that works. And then obviously, um, even giving little explanations, we can see that people were hovering over things, looking for information. All right, let's try with with a question mark bubble to answer what a bit more about what that feature might be. Wow, look at the interactions on it. People are looking for that information. Okay, let's embellish that information. Let's let's make it um, uh, far richer. Uh, let's try and explain it even better. Um, okay, we see the, the, this topic has got more hovers than this one. Okay, let's put that one at the top then because that's a, a bit more of a question. So, so we'll do numbers of different uh, researches on things, but I think a lot of it usually starts with just by session recordings i've been spending so much time watching session recordings yeah for me that's one of the one of the killer killer weapons out there to to find out what's what's going on and then obviously we um we do the eeg things also to get 
to get an insight that you couldn't get from user testing, just per se user testing, asking questions because, you know, you're cutting straight down into the subconscious. And, uh, yeah, if people are getting frustrated looking at a table, you can see where they're looking and where the frustrating bit is. So and then that's, again, you know, we turn it into a test and uh, yeah, we rank it. We think, you know, is is this going to really see a big a big shift? Um yeah, and then, and then obviously if it's too complicated, but it's not when it's a table, it's easy. So, Do you often use those EEG um, uh, research methods for, for the current website, or do you also try that out with things that come out of uh, Figma uh, to see what their uh, reaction is before you even uh, put it live? It would be nice. Um, no, we're not doing uh, for, for those kind of projects just yet. Um it's relatively pricey. Yeah. <laughs> I've saved all the money with Figma. Yeah. It's relatively <laughs> pricey. So um, we usually get yeah, yeah, two or three tests um, just to check. We've been mainly checking on the flow of things. So a customer gets yeah. an email. How do they interpret that email? How, how does it make them feel emotionally? Hearing okay. some yeah. negative news. Um, then they okay, and then they go to the website or they'll go to my products area and then we'll see them navigate and um, yep. follow them through the funnel. And then we we'll make changes based on the benchmark um, test that we did. And then we'll make changes to see if we can uh, do the improvements of where they've got most frustrated, where they didn't, they didn't yep. really make sense to them. And then obviously on, on, the, on the points of joy, uh, one of which uh, of a recent test we did, um, they actually enjoyed reading the text, the copy on the landing page. It, it peaked in joy over, I, I think, four people out of ten. So, I was, oh, that's that's really that's something. Nice. Even you know, a bit of copy can can bring yeah. some some joy to a sat nav buyer's life. <laughs> so, so, was it was it really informative, or was it or was it the funny text, or well, as as you've have we been talking, I'm I'm quite a hands on person, and. Um, yeah, to cut a long story short, as we've been at home and we need to make things a bit more personal, we've turned the web page where it's got my face on it now. Dave from TomTom Tom wants to sell you a device, <laughs> so it's yeah. We wanted to humanise it, but you know how, how yep. can we how can we do that in this in this day and age? I mean, uh, I can't go to the office. We can't do these kind of things. So I set set up the photography myself, and um, I've I've done product shots. I've been super busy. And uh, and then I wrote the text kind of from from my heart, like Dave here at Tom Tom. Thanks for visiting the page. We really appreciate your time. You know, just just be honest. You know, and yeah. it, it, it the feedback in that it really does work. So yeah, um, <laughs> just not things story. to do for your company. And <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So what are the things? So you've been improving a lot of uh, things lately. Uh, because you suddenly had a bit more time to to improve the basics. Mm -hmm. um, assuming that that COVID might stick around for a bit, um, and are there other things on your on your backlog that you said, oh, that that would be really nice to to fix to improve the the, the overall process before we get back to uh, the the daily grind of of zero. Well, for me, um, I think we've got it set up very well. We're quite mature now as a team, and. Something that I think is quite often overlooked is spreading the culture of CRO because it's great that three people do it in a team, in a company of how many people. But if everyone's doing CRO or the CRO involved in many aspects of that company, then your train is going to go way faster. You'll learn so much more about your customers. So, yeah, for me, the focus is now to try and help people develop their own CRO skills, their own methods of validation, the content that they're, that they're making, that they're creating. How can you validate it? How can you know that um, this post is better than this one? This email is gonna, gonna work if you've never asked anyone outside your circle. So I'll introduce um, some areas of the company to things like, um, what's that tool called now? Uh, Usability Hub, where you've got five mm -hmm. second tests. So people could just, did, did you understand the, the offer? What was it about? So you can get a little bit of feedback, some qualitative feedback in no time at all from someone that's not in your your circle. And I find that, you know, that's something that I'm going to help to get the rest of the company, not all of it because it's massive, but where I can help to um, show how to validate things, then 
you know, for me, that's really optimization on a company like culture level. I recently had a session uh, for Digital Elite Day. Um, and it was about uh, how to how to become better as a CRO practitioner. Uh, would you have any tips for for CROs on on or, or just share your story? How how would you how do you go about improving your own knowledge level of of CRO? If you come across something and you say, "Hey, I want to know more about that," what do you do? Do you read a book? Do you get a course? Do you get your hands dirty? Uh, how do you approach that? I'm very much a hands-on person, and uh, I think from from everything that we pretty much mainly learn is by doing um, i'm going to borrow the phrase from growth tribe get shit done that's really what it is get your hands in there see what's happening ask customers ask people does this work does that work for you validate things test them out when and wherever you can um and it, yeah if you feel compelled to to go off and read about uh, web psychology do so uh, i'd say Follow what what excites you, what what you know, what you love about it, what what area particularly excites you, and then really yeah. just just dive into it and learn as much as you can from from wherever. Yeah, and if you want to know anything about comparison tables, go to Dave. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so that's and and for for, for example, uh, a tool like Figma that you just uh, uh, go right in and. And started using it, or did you follow a, a course for it, or were there video tutorials that, that helped you out? Yeah, I've done a few video tutorials, and I'm also one for looking for source files. So if there's a, an issue that I don't know how to solve, there's a great community out there, you know, so how do you do radio buttons, how do you do drop downs? Yeah, there's a source file out there, go look at it, understand how it works, steal it, yeah, <laughs> and use yeah. it, you know what I mean, that's what use it's there it. for, so... It's like templates. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Dave, thank you so much for uh, for sharing your story uh, with us. Uh, so my final question would, uh, for you would be: um, uh, Who I should invite next as a, as a guest on the on the Shiro Cafe, and uh, what I should ask him or her? Um, I believe you've done um, a podcast with Roderick from Brain Engineers, but I would yes. like to invite Eltina von der Fier. Mm-hmm. She's a wonderful presenter. And uh, she's she's helped us out uh, at no end with the with the EEG uh, tests from Brain Engineers. Um, yeah, I, I think you should invite her on and uh, and and have a look at inside people's brains and uh, what she can what she can tell you about the difference between uh, conventional user testing and uh, EEG testing. Yeah, and they also have this uh, this new tool, right? Are you guys using that too, or um, we're not using that one at the moment? No. Um, yeah, let's say uh, with, I think. with uh, COVID budget cut, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll ask uh, Altina about uh, about Brain Peak and uh, the current status of that one. Uh, I think I spoke to Roderick just before they released that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, it will be interesting uh, to get an update from them uh, how that's uh, how that's going. Yeah, right. I've really enjoyed working with them. We've worked with them for a, a number of years now, and uh, it's one of those things. I think it's always good to put a stake in the ground. And see how people are, are experiencing it on a subconscious level, which yeah is always fascinating. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, Dave, thank you so much. Uh, great talking to you, and I uh, hope to talk to you soon uh, somewhere uh, offline. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks for having me. Bye bye. Take care. And this concludes season two, episode forty-one of the Zero Cafe podcast with Dave Powell from TomTom. And again, make sure to share this with your colleagues if you like the content, and especially if you've experienced a similar market shift because of the pandemic. Next Monday in another episode, we stay on the client side when I talk with Emily Oliver, UX and Experimentation Manager at Music Magpie and Declutter, and she is going to share some interesting experimentation results with us. Talk to you then, and always be optimizing.